Welcome to Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. My name is Brandon Bornanson, a serial salesperson and entrepreneur, and I'm sitting down with the world's best sales experts to share their top secrets to sales success. Welcome everyone to today's episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. And I've got Sales Development Executive of the Year, Top 100 Sales co Coach, Speaker and Consultant, Expert Sales Leader, Kevin Dorsey on the line. Kevin, what's going on? Happy uh, Sunday, my man. Ha happy Sunday. No better way to, to kick off a Sunday morning than to talk shop about sales and growth and one percenters. I'm in, man. Let's go. Dude, I love it. And it is my birthday today. So I would not rather spend my birthday than the one and only Mr. Kevin Dorsey. And for those of you that don't know Kevin, Kevin came from right by me here in the Midwest, went to school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I hear that maybe a little bit of a party school. We'll find out more. And then, you know, ended up selling for all, all types of places, right? So from human healthy vending which then turned into Snack Nation, where he led VP of sales over there to Service Titan, the small company that blew up and is just crushing it in the space. And now he's leading inside sales as the VP of inside sales at Patient Pop. Kevin, I'm sure the audience is dying to know, man, who are you? Where did you come from? And how did you get started in sales? Take us back from the beginning. Oh boy. I mean, who am I? Kevin Dorsey. Um, I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I've been blessed to have a lot of amazing people in my life who have been there for me through the ups and downs. Um, man, how I got into sales. So I, I think I took a different path than a lot of people in sales. I chose to get into sales. If you ask a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, I just fell into it or I was a natural born salesperson. I am not and was not a natural born salesperson. I felt that sales was the most secure job I could have. And in college, I was studying kinesiology, but I wasn't sure I wanted to do that forever. And Hold so on, what I was nervous about. Yeah. So kinesi yeah, sorry, kinesiology <laughs> is the study of human movement. Got it. And so okay. I thought I wanted to do like, you know, physical therapy or sports medicine until I realized like I would just be helping, you know, seniors with broken hips all the time. And that wasn't really what I wanted to do. So I was nervous about having a job. And I think something we'll talk about later, but that's led to my success is pattern recognition. And I noticed there was always sales jobs open, always. So they are, right, if I can learn how to sell, I'll always have a job. And so I started selling in college, selling knockoff Cutco knives, not even real Cutco knives, like the knockoff Cutco knives, door to door. I think they were called blades. Like, oh just, my God, just knockoff Cutco's. Why, yeah. why was it knockoff? Just cause like it was, they were cheaper to buy or like, they were, yeah, it was like, a, it was like a competitor. And so like the way they got me was like, you know, why go Cutco where everyone's going is way competitive, do blades. You can make more money here. No one's heard of it. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Horrible. Dude, I'm, I'm thinking about changing my middle name to Brandon Blade Born Nancy. Dude, dude, that's dude, fine. Dude, a, you got the alliteration there. So make it happen. B -b -b. Um, so I went, you know, I was knocking door to door in Madison, Wisconsin, selling knives. Um, you can imagine I did not do very well there at all. I did not. I was not good whatsoever. And so I started, that's why I started take reading you through like good training there when you were doing it or now it's just like, here, so, sell the knives. Looking back, of course, no, but like, if you look at most of like, so I did multi-level marketing too, and all this, most of their training is actually, yep. um, is more like hype than anything. It's just to get you excited, which is something I do take note of in terms of you have to get people excited to sell. So no, they weren't teaching me to sell, but they had me believe I could. So here, here goes my little young ass going door to door, just getting hung up on and door slammed and cops called on me. Luckily I was fast. So I never got caught. And, oh, man. you know, so no, it wasn't good training, but I do respect how they get. I mean, look at these companies, man. Like very few people ever make money in MLM. Very few people. Yeah. The but guys get, at the top that recruited everyone, right. right? But they get thousands of people to do it every single year because they get them to believe. They just get them to believe that. And that's all most people want is they just want to believe they can do something. Right. And then they believe fade out on their own. Bigger. Yeah. I did cut co knives. I did some MLM. I was selling XM radios. I did like the supplements. Then I did some insurance sales. I was doing personal training in college too. So I started selling like, you know, personal training. So something not a lot of people know about me is I've been managing salespeople since I was 19. So I had a team under me my freshman wow. year of 
college. Dude, that's incredible, man. Um, so that's why, you know, I'm starting, I'm starting to get a little bit thin here. Right. I think, I think Drake, Drake said, I'm way too young to feel this old, but, um, yeah, man. So I've sold across and I think it's something I'm the most proud of, I guess, in my career is being successful selling different products, right? Like I'm not just selling healthcare, just selling SaaS. Like I've learned how to sell across industries. And I think what I think when we get into the 1% secret, I'll share why I think I've been able to do that. Yeah, dude, what's been incredible because I've been following you for for a while and I've learned so much from you and and you're an inspiration to me personally and a lot of people that are listening right now, especially for the book and why I was so excited to get you in the book. Um, What's really interesting is you you go into different industries. A lot of salespeople, if they sell for Salesforce and then they leave, then they're going to Oracle and then they're going to Dell EMC or IBM or Microsoft. Like they stay in the niche they think that that's the only way to get rich. And um, to, like, tell me a little bit about like what, why you like to switch or why you've been switching. Like yeah. after Snack Nation, why didn't you go to another food company? And like to go from Snack Nation to Service Titan, you're yeah. like selling Cheetos, you know, now granted, like mm-hmm. the snacks, I'm, I'm whole food plant powered vegan. So I was like, mm-hmm. I loved that you guys had like these vegan snacks that I could get and stuff. So mm-hmm. I love the company. But to go from that to then going to Service Titan, a mobile cloud-based software platform that helps companies manage their like CRM, dispatching, all in one, like two totally different things. Yep. And before Snack, it's actually funny. Like I have truly not taken the time to really update my LinkedIn profile. Like really, like people don't know what I did before then either, right? So I ran personal training studios in LA, built three of them out with my first like real mentor. So built wow. I did all the sales there, managed people there. Then I ran an enterprise fitness equipment sales team selling to hospitals and gyms and things like that. Then I got to human, then I got to snack nation and service Titan. And people have asked like, Oh, like, so like health and wellness is what you're passionate about. It's like, no, see, I, I really do believe most people get this twisted. I'm not a big believer that you have to be passionate in the product you sell. I'm not a big believer. Wow. Dude, I've never, this is the first time I've ever heard this before. I'm excited to learn more. So I'll I'll break this down, right? Like if you're you're passionate about the product, that's why every three years you're going to want a new job because the product will lose its luster just like anything else. Just like anything else, it starts to lose its luster. You start looking for something else. I love to sell. The, the, The sales process is what, I love. And so I love to figure it out and to do it. So the product, as long as it doesn't go against my core values, right? Like I couldn't go slaying cigarettes. Couldn't do it. I don't care if people smoke it, whatever that's good for you, but I couldn't sell it because it goes against my core values. Outside of that, I love the sale, right? I love that process and I love working with people. So it's, it's actually easier than most people understand to switch industries if you study people which is, I think, where we're going to get to in terms of like this top 1% conversation is I study people because no matter what niche, no no matter what product, you're still going to sell to a person. You still have to convince a person to change their behavior because of your communication style. And so it's fun, man. I I enjoy it. I love, I don't know if I'd, I'd love to just stay someplace forever and just like ball out, but I wouldn't ever get bored with it because I'd get to be selling still. And that's what I enjoy to do. Yeah. What's one of the cool things I remember when I first started in my sales career, I used to criticize the the transition. Like, oh, these salespeople that would transition from job to job after every few years. And I'd criticize it. And then, and then like I launched my own company and I'm like, dude, I learned so many things from selling for IBM and then selling for Google and then selling for this company Mm -hmm. and running my own two companies that one was a success, one was a failure. Like the transition and going to different places and being forced to learn different things is like, I think where you take it to the next level. Guy like you, dude, you probably learned, tell me about everything that you learned, like hustling MLM supplements to then doing your own fitness to then like life insurance or whatever. Like, tell me a little bit about, you know, that whole experience. And I want to touch on one thing you just said there, because I, again, I even think hiring managers get this wrong. Who do you think I'd rather hire? someone who was a top performer at one place for five years or someone who's been a top performer for two years at three different places. Yeah. I mean, I'd go with the three years, uh, 
top right, performer three, three different places or whatever. Yeah. Hand, hands down. Cause it shows me they're adaptable, right? Adaptable, like, yeah. and I'll, I'll put those two against each other any day, any single day. And I think even young salespeople coming up, sometimes look at what I have to stay for three to four years because it's going to look bad on my resume. You know, what doesn't look being bad on a resume being number one, <laughs> no one will fucking care. If you right. are number one for a year and the number one again for a year and the number one again for a year, guess what? If you will give me another year of 1% performance, come on in, homie. We'll hug it out. Then I'll send you on your way in another year, right? So just be the best. No one cares about how long you've been at a company. So back to the original question, I guess what i And I've that learned, goes against like 99% of what people think, right? Yes. It's it's silly to me. And I, I, well, this will probably be a different conversation, but the, the things that go on in the sales industry that are like just completely wrong or backwards, just, just boggle my mind. They really, really do. It goes against a lot of things we know about people and we know about motivations. We know about drive sales goes against almost all of it. And we have to find a way to, to fix that, you know, and the, the industry is in a tough place right now. I think I really do. It's in a hard place in terms of it's getting tougher, but we as reps or we as leaders aren't getting better. We're still trying to do all the same shit people were doing before and it's not working yeah. as well. And we can't figure out why it's like, well, yeah. it's obvious why you just got to fix it. Yeah. And I know guys like you are doing things that are different. I'm doing a lot of things that are different and new. And, and what you see is you see a lot of the criticism, a lot of people like, well, why are you, why are you so out there, Kevin? Like, why are you doing all these new things? Why are you trying all these different approaches? Why are you hiring people that left their job, you know, every year? Like, dude, I guarantee you, you got to be getting criticized for that from other people yeah. you're seeing. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, they made, you know, three to five million at their other company. And if they could do that here and they prove that out five times over, like done. Yeah. I think sales leaders underestimate how much they can learn from a top performer. Like if I have someone come in who is just otherworldly and I have them for an entire year, you don't think I can learn a few things from them that I can apply out to the rest of the 99% that levels everyone up just a little bit. So even when that person goes, I'm still in the black. You know, like, again, back to one of the earlier things we talked about, pattern recognition. Yeah. I look for patterns. What If you ask most top sales reps why they're successful, most of them can't actually tell you. They'll say one of two things. They'll either say, oh, it's natural, or I outwork everyone. Okay, bullshit. If your results are 10 times greater than the person next to you, are you really working 10 times harder than they are? You're not. So I look for the patterns and the behaviors. I, I know I drive my managers nuts with this is I ask them the behaviors. I don't care about the numbers. I know the numbers. What are the behaviors leading to the numbers? And if I can pick up on a pattern of a top performer, right, man, Brandon, every time he does a demo, he asks these two questions at the start. And this is how he asks for the close. That's a pattern. I can now take that, build a process around it and teach an entire team how to do it. So one year, I'll take a top performer for one year. Should I'll take a top performer for six months because I'll learn enough to give the rest of the team something, right? And that's what I look for. Yeah, that's amazing. And then when you're trying to study these patterns, because yeah, you could be like, okay, the top performer looking at the Salesforce dashboards, they've got 117 calls, 230 emails, 78 voicemails, 100 invites for the day or whatever. Uh, eight meetings booked, six meetings held, five closed one. And you're like, that's great. And you could say, hey, everyone just do that. But then like, like you mentioned with the pattern, how, how, how should they do that? I feel like a lot of sales leaders, they miss that. So like, when you're trying to study these patterns and study these top performers, how do you get that knowledge and knowledge transfer or, or get that stuff out of them? Mm -hmm. It's more often than not, you can't get it out of them. You just have to observe it, right? There are things that you do that make you successful that I can almost guarantee you're not aware of because they're a habit to you. They're unconscious to you. You don't even know that you do it or do it differently. Whereas someone like me, if I were just to observe you, if I watched 30 of your demos, 30 of your demos, you don't think I could pick up on the things that lead to you being a better sales rep than the person next to you, right? You may not realize it because it's the 10,000th time you've done it, but I only need to listen about 20, 30 times to realize, ah, this is what he does differently. And I chunk it, right? So each, if I'm talking about demos, but this works for prospecting too, right? Like the opener, the questions, the value prop, 
the close and the objections. That's all that goes into any sort of sales conversation. What do the best do differently? And if I can't hear anything differently in the discovery, well then shit, you must be doing something different in the demo. And if I can't hear anything different, that like so you just chunk it out and see, but this is what you asked me earlier, like what have I learned going industry to industry to industry is that messaging yep. matters more than anything else. Messaging, right? Because if you make 50 calls and I make 50 calls and messaging didn't matter, we should always have the same results. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cause you'd all right. use the same message and it'd be right. Water so under when, the bridge. So like activities are important, but at the end, I still, it boggles my mind and I don't understand it. No one really talk, especially in the sales leadership world, there's this dichotomy. You got the, the thought leaders that talk a lot about messaging, but sales leaders don't. And it's like, what happened? Like, all right, you perfect world, perfect world. You always got your ideal persona on the phone. I can promise you most people would still fail because they don't know how to message it right. And so that's what I've learned going through different industries is how to craft a message that resonates with people. So most of my scripts now are relatively fill in the blank because the formula is there. I understand how people think. I understand what language to use. I understand language patterns and rhetoric and copywriting, like all the things that drive emotion. So the messaging matters, man. And I don't think enough people understand that is what's actually happening on the demo. You did wow. everything right. You got all the stats. I got perfect. Let's walk through this. I have seamless.ai leads. So I got direct contacts for everybody. Yep. And I got sales loft so I can make my local dials and send all of my cadence emails. Yep. And I've got zoom to record it and I've got something to do it. And I get a hundred CEOs on the phone. If I don't have the right tone, the right messaging, the right value prop, the right questions and the confidence to ask for it, it still doesn't matter. And that's, that's the secret of the 1% man is like the messaging. Uh... How, do you, how do you communicate? with people because if you're writing shitty emails, it doesn't matter how many you send out. If you have a shitty script, it doesn't matter how many calls you make. If you have poor training, it doesn't matter how good the script is because no one will fucking do it. There you go. Yeah, dude, I, I love that. So, so what is in your opinion, the sales secret that you've seen going from selling to every single industry under the sun from snacks to fitness to service Titan, a massive, you know, cloud-based company to, to patient pop. The, the sales secret is, in your opinion, what is that again? Study people. Study people. Study people. people. And, Learn the, and the messaging, you, right? And the messaging, right? You have or to no. study people to know what the messaging needs to be, right? That's, that's where it okay. comes through and understanding how people respond to things. Salespeople do shit that only salespeople do, and it's comical to me. Like, it's, just, it's pure comedy. We say words that only salespeople say. Let me give you an example. Okay, that was one, by the way. Salespeople, all right. Let me give you an example. Let me ask you a question. Currently, how are you, right? Like, good question. How much does it cost? Good question. Really? That's a fucking good question. Or like, salespeople. <laughs> what does that even mean? Right? Like, you, and I, you and I talking right now, I'd be like, hey, Kevin, you know, good job so far on the uh, interview. Good, good. That was a good question. Like, good question. I've never Actually, said that to one of my friends before. Right, but before I move on, let me backtrack real quick. Let's make sure that we're on the same, but like, God damn it. Right. So you have to understand what are the core motiv motivators of almost all human beings? What are the core motivators? Do you know? Cause this is how you build uh, messaging. I mean, I, I think, for, well, I would assume it's going to be different for everyone, but for me, like anyone that knows me, I, I publicize my four to five goals. Like mm -hmm. one of them is to positively impact a billion people. One of them is to build a hundred million dollar business. Third is to become the num number one husband in the world, which I don't know how to do. And then number four is to get to 5% body fat. Those are my oh, yeah. four goals. So like so those are goals. anything those I do goals. aligns with those four. Oh, okay. Different, different question. Different question. This is where a lot of leaders struggle too, is they try to like motivate their people through these external goals, right? Like, don't you want a new car? Or don't you want to make this money? Or don't you want to do this? There's a difference between a goal and a motivator, right? Like if you like a core motivator for most, for most people is security more than thriving. Okay. It's security. Yep. And salespeople forget this. They approach selling with a thrive mindset. I'm going to make things better. I'm going to make it bigger. I'm going to make it faster. I'm going to get you more results. Human beings, like their brain, our brains don't work to thrive, right? 
security is the core driver of anyone. Ask almost, it was like the fun experiment. If you ask a lot of people what motivates them, they'll say money, which is bullshit. Money does not motivate most people. If they did, everyone would hit quota. There, conversation done. The second part though, if you ask them, they want financial security. So what do they really want? They want security. It's not financial security. They want security. And so if you and remember that- what does security that part, mean? Does that mean like job security? That's what you have to find out. Okay. That's where that's where you're going, right? So like with patient pop, for example, we're working with private practice doctors, service titan, right? I was working with plumbers, snag nation. I was working with office managers and HR, right? So defining what security meant to them, right? That's where you get into the messaging, right? You find what those core motivators are, and then you find ways to unsell the status quo around it. Does that make you follow me here? Right. So I'm like, if I know like you want to be secure, you want to have, if you're an HR, for example, I'll use this. What does security mean to HR? It means lower turnover. It means lower workers comp. It means lower benefit costs. It means things like that. Right. So if I can then break down why putting fucking pretzels in a tub is not leading to that security you're looking for. Yep. Here we go. Right. So there's a lot of ways to do it. And then this goes one level deeper is studying language. Right. I wish if I gave a tip to any like salesperson out there, start studying copywriting. Study copywriting. Because the first book I read in college was Dan Kennedy's. uh, Hell yeah. Uh, the ultimate sales letter, ultimate Dan sales Kennedy, letter. the ultimate sales letter. I read it when I was like 18 or 19. Right. I didn't know what half of it meant at the time. Like when you're 18, you don't know what the, he's even talking about, but mm-hmm. right. uh, now, but think about that real quick. At, but that think about what you just said, you and I are both top performers and we share a commonality that we studied copywriting. Wouldn't have known it otherwise, but that's a small thing that we've both gone through because when you study copy, you understand how to create emotion and need from written work. And if you can do it from written word, then what can you do? You could do it verbally. You could do it socially. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't know, like, l- luckily I've studied copy, but every sales team in this country should have a professional copywriter on their team. That's who should be writing your scripts. That's who should be writing your emails marketing unless they have a copy thousand writer, percent thousand right? percent dude why why hasn't it you know they always talk about hey uh aaron ross who, who we're interviewing for the book next week like you need the inside salesperson you need the outside salesperson you need the account manager dude you're the first person i've talked to that said you need a sales copywriter full-time on the team that Full look part. at the persona and that are writing the sequences and cadences dedicated to the persona that's a Yes. That's fucking brilliant. Yeah. Dude, I like, I've written every cadence my team has ever sent. Nice. Every. Wow. Not, not marketing, not enablement, not product marketing. I've written every single cadence my teams have ever written. And my teams generally have 40, 50 different cadences. So like when I get into messaging, I have it by persona, by okay. stage by industry. I'm using specific social proof based off the industry or based off who I'm talking to. The value prop to an office manager is different than the value prop to HR or the office manager to the doctor. It's different. So I have different cadences and scripting for every single one of those back to messaging, right? Yep. This, this is where it, this is where it all comes from, man. And like copywriting is immense. So as a perfect example, um, I'm new at patient pop, right? Yep. Um, Congrats, only, um, by the way. Three months in, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, I'm coming up. I'm coming up on two right now. Um, oh, awesome. Absolutely loving it, loving it. And it was like end of the month, and I wrote just a three email cadence for kind of like an end of the month special, right? Okay. And this is I don't have a ton of industry knowledge yet, but I understand people, I understand what core motivators are and how to communicate them. Wrote the cadence, gave it to the team, my AEs and my AAs. They looked at it, they said, oh, "Okay, dude, these are cheesy, man." These emails won't work. I'm like, well, go for it. Go for it. You don't have a better one. Go for it. They sent it out. <laughs> right. First day. Right. Like, first what day. What are you going to do, man? Right. Sit there? Three, three extra deals pop. First day. Second day. Two more. Third day. Last day of the month. We got four more deals from this three email. And the team's sitting there going like, how does this shit work? 
It's like, exactly. Right. Like when you study these things, like, you know, how to drive emotion, how to communicate. Right. So the messaging man, emails, voicemails, scripting. Yeah. Dude, it, it was funny. I, I recognize that when I read, um, and, and the, the premise of this book, Kevin, so you're aware is like, you know, I, I needed the, the world's best sales leads to be super successful, but then I needed to know like what to do with these people, which is why I built Seamless. And then I, over a decade, read hundreds of sales books. And I'm like, it took a decade to read hundreds of sales books. There's gotta be a faster way. And now we're interviewing experts like you to feature your expertise. But I realized that there were like scripts sales objection. I'm not interested, no budget, need to talk to someone, you know, you're going to do these, you're going to run into the same things over and over again. Like you had mentioned the messaging and, um, dude, it's, it's crazy. The copywriting, how critical it is. I I wrote a thousand page sales playbook that I update like every week Mm -hmm. with new scripts, like how much content I'm writing I, I don't write all of the the uh, scripts for our sales and marketing team. I wish I did though, because mm-hmm. it, it'd probably get a lot better. Uh, it, how time consuming is that for you? It's it's time consuming, but not as much as people think, right? Like give me three days and I can write four or five really good cadences. Because also I'm not starting from scratch, right? Like it's not like I'm sitting down with a blank piece of paper going like, okay, how do I, how do I write a cadence? It's like, I've gone through them enough and I track, I track everything, open rates, click rates. There are emails that are like, talk about bringing marketing into sales. I've written cadences specifically to drive clicks, not opens. I'm driving clicks so I can cookie them so I can follow them and then put them on an additional cadence where they're getting more calls, right? Just like any other marketing funnel. So you learn as you go through it. It doesn't take that much time. It really doesn't. And I'll give some people some, I'll give an advice here. Um, I've only given people that like know me very well. I've done consulting. One of the first things you should do in any new industry is go onto Google and search like industry meme or industry jokes. Right. Okay. Private practice meme, HR meme, or like a human resources jokes, doctor jokes, things like that. Because what you're going to see is you're going to see how your industry joke with each other. How like what do they think is funny? What do they think matters? Right. So I, you know, people say breakup emails don't work. Right. I love it. Breakup emails don't work. No bad breakup emails don't work. I'll talk right. about like service Titan. So in the breakup email there, right. You know, you give them like the A, B, like oh whatever, blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. Well, the C was like. Or you've been trapped by an angry Yelp reviewer that's holding you hostage because you were two minutes late, right? Now, that industry- yeah, that's, super, that's super niche to that contractor or whatever, that plumber who's dealing with that bullshit. Right. They're going to do it, right? They're like, ah, I get it. Some of the different emails I use there too was like, what do a lot of like home service industry people not like, really don't like? Handymen handyman they joke about each other but like oh i gotta go fix what a handyman did right because a handyman says they can do all this shit and do it just as well for half the cost right so i had emails in there is is your current software the handyman of software are you duct taping your business together right so i'm using their language and their jokes throughout the email cadences right people like to laugh people like to smile people don't like to think stop making me think right and have some fun with it those are examples. If you learn people, find the memes, find the jokes, find the way they talk with each other and start inserting that into, right, your messaging. Wow. Yeah, you know, it's crazy. I love this. This is straight fire. I love messaging and scripts. Like it's one of my favorite things in the world. And Mm -hmm. I haven't, we haven't gotten to highlight this a lot in this show. So I'm really excited. When it comes to, um, it reminds me what, what you do. Like I, I sold for IBM and Google and, and the way that they market, this is a lot of like marketing, but integrated into sales. Cause in marketing and digital marketing, like with Google, you got to have a very specific persona. You got to write the ad and the subheader ad specific to the persona. Then you have to drive them to a persona specific landing page. And if you do that, that maximizes the click through rates and the conversion and the quality score that Google gives you. Then after that, you have to give a very specific value proposition to the persona on the landing page with a potentially 
highly uh, specific video sales letter. And then like the offer has to be persona specific. Everything that the marketers do, like in digital marketing to acquire online customers, it sounds like you've taken and you've incorporated into your messaging. Like, where did you get that knowledge or that? How did you learn to do that? Like, it's Um, different. I mean, I think as you, (laughs) marketers understand people better than salespeople do, right? Because they're taking things of like, you're trying to generate something from nothing. They've been studying people way more. Actually, I'll rephrase it. Marketers study behavior better than salespeople right? Like one of the first people I meet with at a company is the marketing team. And you know what I want to know? What keywords are most popular? What What links get the most? What are they searching for? Because if I know that, guess where those keywords are going to go? Into my outbound cadence emails. Damn. That's something that people probably are not doing. Of course not. What's, I've never been asked from a sales leader, hey, what, what are the keywords uh, that we're bidding on? What are the keywords that our competitors are bidding on? That was like my secret hack, one of my secret mm-hmm. hacks, because I would take all that stuff and then put it, I'd look at the value propositions even of competitors in the ads mm-hmm. and put it into my copy. Yeah, and I think, um, and I'll, I'll give a shout out here. So Andy Mackinson, uh, he's the CMO at Snack Nation and one of my early mentors as well. He and I, clicked very early on on like the sales letter things we i mean we did snack nation man like people know all the shit that we did there man like dude we had like an 11 page sales letter that went into the direct mail packages that we sent we went full keller eben pagan dan kennedy style and so he he and i really did talk a lot of sales marketing marketing sales back and forth and so to have a tight relationship there right like my favorite conference to go to traffic and conversion summit by the digital marketer groups, nice. right? Because awesome. they are way further ahead than the B2B conferences, way further ahead. You learn things there. So I think it was yeah. a combination of getting into sales letters early, but then having a great mentor as well that, boom, we just went back and forth on it. And it's made my career significantly better because of it. Yeah, I always laugh. And I mean, all, all the props to Snack Nation, but like they're selling snacks to companies, right? And they do it in a really smart way. But like, that's a very hard, competitive, commoditized market. If you want to talk right. about a commoditized market that's hard it's to sell food. to. It's food in a box, right? Food in and, a box to companies. And we never got to speak to the DM, ever, right? Brandon, you hopping on a call to talk to me about snacks for your team? Dude, I, I, I got no, no time, right. zero. So, so not only did we have a product that was relatively commoditized, zero provable ROI zero provable ROI. I can't look you in the eye and say, Oh, uh, zero ROI. You're right. I was just thinking like, how do I justify the cost and ROI? Can't. And no access to the DM. And we built a sales process there that absolutely crushed. And it's one of the things I'll look back on in terms of my career that I think helped me learn so much because if I can do that, snacks in a box, selling seamless AI, Patient pop, service titan. Dude, like, like 183 employees. Like, it was funny. Like, a few weeks ago, I, I remember thinking about you guys. And I'm like, they're fucking selling chips in a box. And they built a 200-employee company. I, and there's a lot of technology guys out there for everyone listening, guys and gals. Uh, they've got a recommendation engine that really analyzes people and behavior. And, like, there's a lot of tech behind it. But like when I think about VCs and when I was pitching VCs, I thought of you guys and I'm like, dude, if these guys can build a 200 person company, I can build seamless AI. But you guys have done some incredible stuff there. Yeah. And and like, and I I, I love them all there and I still wish them nothing but the best, you know, and that's where if I now look at the opportunity to have it patient pop, massive market, similar to Snag Nation, where it's just like a massive market to sell to. And I have an ROI proving product. Yep. And I get to talk to the decision maker. I mean, here we go. Right. And so that's why I'm so excited is like to continue to take what I've learned and the patterns I've realized. Right. Like they were one of the things they said very early on is like, oh, Katie, like we shouldn't take these office manager meetings. One of the first thing they said at, at patient pop was like, oh, really, really? You shouldn't, you shouldn't meet with the office manager because you can't sell them. Okay. Come here. Let's hug it out. We are going 
to do this and I'll show you how. Because I spent five years doing it for snacks in a box, right? Which by the way, was my recommendation. You're lucky. Snack Nation was what won. I wanted to call be call it snack in a box. Right. Like, and we could have done so much fun with that. We had so much fun with snack in the box, but whatever. I That's digress. Awesome. Did you go there like before they, they called it snack nation? Cause didn't, mm-hmm. yeah, because yeah, so human, you were at a company that got acquired or whatever, health, healthy vending, human vending. So that no, snack nation was birthed from human. So, so I'll talk about pattern recognition. Okay. So back, it's things like this, man, where we, we are a franchise or the number one franchise in the country in terms of healthy vending and healthy markets. But the majority of our inbound leads were coming from offices too small for vending. Okay. Now, a lot of companies would see that and be like, how do we go get better leads? Yep. We looked at it the other way and say, well, this is where the demand is coming from. I wonder if people would be willing to buy it. Right. And so we started, we literally like talk about snacks in a box. That's literally what we did for the first early customers. We're like, Hey, we can't put a vending machine in your office, but we can put some snacks in a box and send it to you. We'd be willing to buy it. That's uh, such a yeah, badass sure. MVP. I love <laughs> and that. So, and so, but it was again, pattern recognition. It's like, not just throw shit away, but like, if you look at a lot of the big companies out there, they all made a pretty big pivot, right? What was it? Instagram used to be like a food, like, um, app. Right. Yep. And they just realized everyone was looking at the pictures. Yep. Um, and all of these guys slack, right. dude, all yep. these guys, same thing. And this is funny, like for the audience out there that, Hey, there is no such thing as like overnight success in sales or whatever. You got to work your ass off and you got to pivot and you got to learn and you got to adapt. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's what Kevin, Kevin talks a lot about switching, uh, careers and like learning and then being number one at all these places. Like, Dude, the Slack was a different thing for gaming that then became this chat platform, uh, like you had mentioned. Uh, what was the other one that you just mentioned? Um, like Instagram. Instagram was Instagram. a was a was a restaurant check in. But here, yeah. this is this no is no one was the using problem. it. No one was yeah, using no one the location. They were only using this, the pictures the picture. because the but picture had is, a filter. This is what's gone. Or what's made it hard though now with the VC age we're in is people think they have to get the product right. First, people are investing in the product as it stands now. And so it traps people in to trying to make it work and not pivoting because someone wrote them a $5 million check for the idea they had at the time. And they're either not willing to do that pivot or go, right? That that's, you know, taking money is you need to do it because it can help you, but you have to make sure you're getting it from people that would be willing to let you move and pivot. The only reason human could pivot to snag nation was because it was all self-funded at that point in time. We could make that move. And so what a lot of people don't realize is I built out the snag nation sales team while still having another sales team, right? We still had human, wow. we still had all that. And we built that okay. out in difference and then eventually merged everything over and went and it was a significantly better business because of it. Cause again, back to pattern recognition, there are patterns that people just don't pick up on because they don't pay attention. They get so caught up in like the day to day. They just don't pick up on what is the market actually telling me? What are my customers actually telling me? If you want another great tip, if you listen to calls, listen to demos, but don't listen to you, listen to the prospect, first of all. And second of all, if you use a tool that allows you to like have the transcriptions, find all the places that your customers said, wow, or I didn't know that. Interesting. Wow. Or I didn't know that. Right. Cause now, you know, what are the things that they're like, wow. Well now if you're going outbound prospecting, you take the wow moments, you put it into the outbound side mm-hmm. of things. You find ways to do it. Who, which, which one of my reps gets the most wows. That's the rep I want to pattern across and go through. Right. So it's just taking time to do this shit, man. Like most people, I don't, I mean, there's a few things I think I'm dropping that maybe no one's heard before, but it's just taking the time to do it. Just take the time to do it. Spend uh, v, v, any VP of sales that's listening to this. When's the last time you listened to demos on your team? Like actually listened? You're yeah. spending millions I, of dollars as per a year. CEO, and I don't have a big company. You know, we're 40, 50 employees now. Now, granted, we did in like five months, but mm-hmm. I haven't listened on a rep demo in three months. 90 days minimum. And I feel sick about it. There's no excuse. Right. And and it doesn't take that much time and it's more valuable than most people realize. If you blocked one day and listened to 
10 demos at 2x speed. You don't, don't listen on regular speed. Listen on 2x speed. You don't think you'd learn something that would help your team come through or things are happening that you don't realize, right? It's like, dude, everyone's saying pricing this way. That's not how we should do pricing. Or wow, every time we bring up pricing, the candidates are like, or prospects go, oh, that's it? Well, maybe you're undercharging, right? right? You know, like there's things like that where you have to, it all comes down to what is said human to human. I don't care what anybody else says, because that is, that's what it comes down to. And I, you can I listen actually, to those. Oh, go ahead, keep yeah. going. I actually think there's a lot of VPs of sales out there that if I did or you did walk in with a thousand of their perfect candidates, perfect candidates, they'd still be nervous to hand those over, right? Because now the built-in excuse of access isn't there anymore, right? Do you trust every single one of your salespeople to sell your perfect persona the right way? I don't think many people can say that. And I, I can't even say that right now. And I work very, very, very hard at this. And so I know if I'm putting in this much work to get that messaging right, people that aren't, they won't, they, you can't, you just can't keep up, right? So get the messaging right, learn your prospects, ask the right questions, study copywriting, study rhetoric, study language, shit, man, like study people. This, this is one of my favorite books called Behave by Robert Sapolsky, right? Laws of Human Nature, Robert Greene, like wow. study, study people. You'll, you'll be a better salesperson for sure. Yeah, one of the way, and I, how do you, how do you recommend studying copywriting, studying people? Like, what, what's some of the fastest ways to get started with that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's good either like courses or or books, right? So if it's copywriting, you know, Gary Keller, Evan Pagan, Frank Kern, Dan Kennedy, um, like just go out and search it, right? So I mean, there's hundreds of books out there. Amazon is my search engine, not Google. Like copywriting, I'm gonna see everything that comes up there, right? Yeah. Psychology, right? Like truly like language psychology. That's what's so much fun now is like, they're actually showing how the brain reacts to different words, right? Have you read Methods of Persuasion yet? I have not, Ooh, no. You will love that shit. I'm Go grab that. that down right now. Okay. Methods of Persuasion by Nick Kalenda. Phenomenal book. And again, it gets into the science of language, right? <laughs> they did a study that they used words associated with elderly, with being old bingo nursing home murder she wrote readers digest like there's like words that are associated with old and the people that were in that study group they didn't know what was happening the people in that group walked slower than the people that didn't have those words oh my gosh okay. and just because it mentally it psychologically played right. into so tell me we like so salespeople, especially early on you want people being open to talking to you and respectful, right? So using words around open, flexible, curious, right? Wide open. You use words that are associated with being open. That's the end of the script. That's into the emails, right? Is it, it, it's about getting everything we can of every interaction, study language, right? So I, I mean, I can recommend some books there too, um, but those, those are some of the- What's your favorite copywriting book? So Methods of Persuasion is your favorite people book, right? Yes. What's um, your favorite copywriting? And I know it's hard, right? Because if you ask me my favorite I mean, sales book, I, it'd be hard for me to say. The, I mean, the ultimate sales letter is good. Most of the copywriting I got from courses though. So like Gary Keller has a course on copywriting. Evan Pagan has a course on copywriting. Okay. Um, same with Frank Kern. So like most of it's been from, Oh, Perry Belcher. Perry Belcher is another phenomenal copywriter. He's in Mark, one. mark my words, Kevin Dorsey and I may be launching a course on copywriting and sales scripts yes. because I, I've never met someone as passionate about more passionate about scripting and copywriting than me. Dude, Kevin, be on the lookout. 2019, Dorsey and I are launching a course on cop sales copywriting. So get ready. Okay. So Gary Let's Keller, go. Evan mm -hmm. Pagan, Frank uh, Kern, Perry Belcher. Yeah, like Frank those. Kern's great too. Yeah. Yeah, because I started getting into the sales video, uh, video sales letters. Because mm -hmm. my goal is like yep. seamless sales like salesforce.com. So it's a hundred bucks a month per user, unlimited leads. And it's like mm -hmm. anyone can afford that anywhere in the world. Three bucks a day. Anyone can afford a hundred bucks. Why 
am I spending so much time building this massive sales team that has to demo, demo, like one call, demo, close people. It's like, but then if you get into the psychology of uh, video sales letters and selling automatically software, mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of like, that's why you see these two hour webinars because these yeah. webinars, they break you down. And then they uh -huh. build you back up and then they make you believe that like what you're presenting is, is the best thing for, for your right. life. Um, yeah. it's because what a, a, a well-written sales letter is exactly the same format as a demo. Yep. It's the same formula, same formula, but you Why can't you personalize it. So it's like, right. how do you but do I that? Take it and then you, but I use it. Right. So it's like, why are we here? What's the current state of the problem? How did we get to that problem before I solve that problem? Let you let me educate you and let you know why it's not your fault that the problem is where it right. is. Then yep. I'll talk about how I built up my credibility to even answer this problem for you. Small takeaway, then go in like it's a formula. Yep. It's right? a it's psychology, a like it's a it's a formula. You got these it's boxes the that you gotta fill in, yep. different stages yep. in the boxes. It's it's been fascinating to study the whole like sell automatically be, without demoing it's really yeah. hard it, it will it's, take years to master yeah and it's it's not none of what you or i are talking about today is easy it's just better it's just better right and if if we work hard in the right areas you get better results from it it's really that simple right like selling automatically if imagine if you have both then right right like like you have you have You'll never be able sales. to just have one just for yeah. the sales audience everyone freaks out oh yeah. robots are gonna dude robots are not gonna replace salespeople. you're always gonna need the one-to-one -one interaction and engagement um but if you had both this is why i fight with i don't like the whole bullshit about like cold calling is better than social selling is better than video and you this is the only channel it's like dude marketers from my background selling for digital marketing I'm not going to bitch about which channel's better. We use them all to try to go 100x on results for all of them. And same with salespeople. Like, yeah. you just got to do it all. Yeah, Jeb, Jeb Blount said it very well in Fanatical Prospecting. He said, an and mentality. It's not an or mentality. It's an and mentality. Social and phone. Love that. And email. And trade show. And voicemail. It's an and mentality. So it's not an or right now we can talk about robots on another conversation um because i actually disagree but i like based uh, off what sales is nothing but if you really think about it don't people can listen to me and get pissed off i don't really care sales is nothing but a very long if then sequence i completely agree thousand percent and, and so, i i I built an if then like sales objection. I own salesobjections.com and I built a ton of if then scripts. Okay. Like it's so, always if this, then that. Guaranteed. So to say, and as a sales leader, you spend most of your time trying to get people to follow the if then sequence you want. Not creating a new one. It's getting them to follow the programming that you have in place. I'd be willing to bet when you meet with your sales team, most of your time is spent on things they should already know or should already be doing. It's not on new things. So when people tell me that salespeople yep. won't get replaced when at the very core of what we do is an if then sequence with someone that'll actually follow it and not be afraid of it and actually be a better listener. You realize that they have AI therapists now, AI therapists that read eye dilation and body temperature and skin temp to give better feedback and patients trust them more than a human being because they know a human being will judge them. Wow. That's insane. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's further along than most people realize. And we, we can have that conversation, but at the end of the day, why I think it might happen is again, you have predictable messaging back to it. You can learn yep. so much more. You can go through it faster. And you can analyze the data. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm with you. I, I'm in the camp of, uh, <laughs> I'll put it this we're, way. We're we, doing we, some we crazy shit. Like be, you need I know, fewer salespeople. Let's put it that way. You'll need smarter. Fewer. You right, yeah, right. use the AI to be smarter. Uh, because, because I do agree. Like the whole premise of my second book, sales objections is literally it's an, everything is a chess game. It's an, if then, then if yeah. this, then that statement, like, that's, 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 it, that's when I wrote the thousand page playbook because I fucking realized, holy shit, 
sales is sales is a if this and that. And if you know all the plays in the chess game, it's game over. And that's when I became a millionaire myself because I wrote all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, that's why, so this year I've really spent most of my time in reading on the science of learning because I believe there's just a learning gap in the industry as a whole, right? Because again, Mm -hmm. if you know that, if it's an if then equation, why the fuck can we not get everyone to do it? Right. Yeah, and true. so right. That, Why not? it was, you know, if I'd be willing to bet any sales leader that listens to this or reads this, I'm not even sure what format we're, we're cruising. Right. So I don't know how this format's going to be put out there, but if you ask them where Both they spend video most of their and time, audio, so right. it'll be like all three. All right. If you ask them where they spend most of their time, it's not on new things. It's getting them to update their pipeline the right way. It's getting them to do discovery the right way. It's getting them to ask the, to do what we already believe is right. And so I looked at it from the other way. I was like, all right, maybe that just means people aren't learning it right. They're not making it a habit, right? And so that's where I've gone this year is like learning the science of learning, how people actually learn and retain and can execute information and then the study of habits. How can I teach it to them? And how can I make it a habit for them to follow, right? And so- What's been the biggest thing that you learned with habit, like getting people to create habits? That's so, interesting. It's man, it's hard. So I'm going through, so I've read like, you know, the power of habit. Um, there's a few other ones. I'm going through atomic habits right now and I actually struggle with it because in the definition of a habit, there's a lot of things that sales goes against. Cold calling sucks. And I don't care what anyone like, Oh, what it sucks. It hurts to cold call. People forget that rejection is one of the most powerful pains in the human world right? Go back to our tribal, you know, tribal days, our hunter gatherer days. It even happens now. If someone did something against the tribe, they didn't kill them. What did they do? They banished them. Rejection was worse than death, right? So how do you make cold calling attractive? How do you make it easy? How do you give positive reinforcement? How do you get instant gratification? Make knowing that you're going to make 90 of these and have them all be bad. How, like And so I'm trying to map those things out where if I can give instant gratification to hitting benchmarks, if I can give instant gratifications to the behaviors, right? So I, I talked about this at Topo. I like to recognize the behavior again on the call, even if the result wasn't there. Shit, man, your tone was perfect. That a boy, right? Ooh, you handled that objection. That's how we want to do it. Love yes. that. Right? Yeah. So like recognize the behaviors. Um, you don't need to study the closed one, like, there's always good things and bad things right. that can be improved on right. any and sales so, instance. Um, me and Mark, um, Mark uh, Smith at, over at Wampley and I chatted about this a little bit or like messaged about it where it's like, you can, it's like recognize the behaviors you want, coach on the behaviors you don't, right? So like I posted this call that one of my reps did and man, it was a battle and they were going back and forth and the owner kept pushing back on seeing the demo or whatever. Like, Oh, like, you know, I want my wife, you know, to take a look at it too sort of thing. And my rep, like out of nowhere, just grabs this bomb, right? He reaches up in the stratosphere of sales knowledge and goes, well, if you wanted to see a movie, would you send your wife to see it for you first? And I was like, Oh shit. Right. Like super fired up. Right. And he got the guy to laugh, but then he didn't ask for the meeting. He had him. He had him, he had him right there. No, uh, he didn't answer the meeting. So then, so the call ended with like a follow up call scheduled or whatever. And I posted about how proud I was of Lewis for that call, you know. And some people like, well, he didn't get the meeting. I was like, y'all are missing the point. The behavior I wanted, I recognized, and he's going to feel good about that call. And then I coached him on how he should have asked for the meeting guess what happens? He yep. did book that call on the next one and he got it, right? So habits, you have to recognize the good things that you do here. You do need to make it easy. Habits are about not having to think. So as much as you can get things in front of them without them having to think about it, right? I'm building like, I build like placemats for my team, right? Because again, the amount of things you actually have to remember as a salesperson is immense. So I build like a placemat called like the battle mm-hmm. map that has personas, questions, objections, flip it over, competitor information, social Smart. proof, facts and figures, because they, um, I think Google actually released this study. That That's the really smart. The differentiator <laughs> of some of the top performers is not knowledge, it's access to knowledge. How quickly can they access it? Search and get it. I completely right? agree. 
So yeah. if, I, if I, if I can make it where you don't have to search, right? Like, I don't know who you guys compete with, but whatever, zoom info. Uh, or something, D- right? DNB, zoom info, discover. DNB, right. And so, okay. So and someone DNB goes, an Oh, investor, but we still compete with them. Cool. Right. It's like, Oh, we use discover org. Well, now you're asking your sales rep with less than a year of experience selling your product to that persona in a quarter of a second to go, okay, persona based competitor based information. What do I do next versus, Oh, well, of course you use discover, or at least you're using something. You know how many people are still using the phone book right now, but how are you? Because it's in front of them. Yeah, right? it's right there. They just have yeah. to find it fast, right? Yeah, so we, that's another. We created like a uh, why I I built like salesobjections.com was a, a sales objections tool to help my reps click a button and then get the scripts for every sales objection because I didn't want them to think about what they had to say. Yeah. And then I was like, ah, we'll turn it into a book instead. Yeah, dude, I I completely agree. The the searching of the and the funny part is most sales teams they have all this data, the content, the sales content. I've run into this problem now. We're going up a huge seven-figure deal. And my VP of sales and I are like putting together custom content when I knew we overcame that sales objection 7,000 times. We mm-hmm. use this guy. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, dude, like, why am I writing custom content right now? When we wrote, we spent 100 hours overcoming that objection with thousands of pages of content. Mm-hmm. Uh, completely agree. Oh, yeah, on the messaging, just because I, I don't want to get uh, this is straight fire and I love it, but you, I know your brain, you've got the system, you've got the process. And I, I read this book called business model uh, design or whatever business model generation. It, they had boxes for like, the lean what, canvas. what's your business? What's the, yeah, it's like the lean canvas. It's the business model. Generation. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I have an option, but like, uh, oh, damn, I don't have it here. Mm-hmm. Um, it's at home. But like, it's got boxes mm-hmm. of like the, sh- the content that you need to fill in. And I could tell your brain for the messaging, you said your sales secret is you need to know people and you need to write the messaging, right? Is that the best like summary yep. for it? Yeah. So the writing the messaging there, I could tell like anytime you're going to write these hundreds of sales scripts, you write out like this thing and then you got to write it. This thing, you got to write it. Like what are those boxes that you call? And yep. then, how, like, how do you fill them in? So what are the boxes? Yes. Persona? Um, so persona. Yep. All right. So per, I guess okay, first I start. When in, you say persona, what does that mean? Yeah. So I mean, oh, go ahead. Role, start, like role. start at the higher level. So in, first I start industry, right? Like every company, whoever they're targeting, you're going to have your top five to six industries, right? It's like, so for example, like Snack Nation, it was, you know, SaaS, um, finance, banking, marketing, right? Like you have that niche, right? At service times, like, you know, plumbing, HVAC, electric, you know, so you go by industry because they're all going to have different language, right? The pers- the language that an office manager would use at a plumbing shop is different than one at an HVAC shop. So you do start industry as a whole, right? Then you go persona. And when I say persona, I mean role, right? Like what is their role there? Then from there, we go, have you used the, um, the buyer's matrix by Jill Conrad is a beautiful. Oh yeah. Tool, that right? was actually so, my first B2B sales book I ever read was Snap. selling to big companies. Oh, selling to big. Yeah. Selling to big is great. Cause when Snap I joined is- IBM, I joined IBM and I'm like, fuck, I don't know. Like I, I used to, I built a company that did online poker. I don't know how to sell to big fortune 500 companies. Yeah. I don't know shit. And then I read, uh, snap selling. Yeah. Snap, snap's good too. And then it's like, Hey, problem we solve, right? The problem we solve for that persona, and there should be at least three or four problems we solve for that persona. Okay. I'm writing these down. What they are doing to solve it right now. What are they doing? Got it. Right. And then we get into the STFW, right? So, so the fuck what? Then we get into STFW. STFW. So the fuck what? Right. All right. So, so what? So here's how we solve it. And then STFW, right? So you have to go one layer deeper. And so I make flashcards for all this shit too. So they're like, I call them gaps. It's like, all right, here's the gap. What's the, and then the last thing you write is what's the question you can ask to expose the gap? I do not believe in discovery questions. Most discovery questions are wrong. They're a waste of time. No one uses them. Right. 
like you have to earn the right to get into discovery questions. Gap questions allow you to build curiosity and like sell your product without actually selling it. And when right? you say the gap questions, is this kind of following Keenan's book or is this different? Um, this is like, so it's actually funny, man. Shit. Like, did Keenan you read his book or, or no? I, I did read it. I've read it twice already. It's phenomenal. I just bought I it. I haven't read it. I heard it's amazing. Oh. I got to pick it up. And Keenan actually coached me like 10 years ago oh, yeah. when I just was early in yeah. sales and he's fire. Yeah. So like I've been teaching gap questions for years, gap selling for, for years. It's just wow. funny that it coincided that like Keenan thinks the same way yep. that I do. Right. But it was, it was looking at it and saying like, all right, um, for, all right, like for I will use you, you guys an example, right? What's something you do better than most people do right now. So we have a real time search engine. So yeah, like, real-time let's, search engine. Let, uh, let's go through this process for seamless, right? Yeah, because, um, so people actually apply. So number one persona, um, does it matter if it's the influencer user decision maker? Cause the user would be a sales yes. development rep. The influencer yes. would be an AE and then the DM would be a VP. So 100% it matters. 100%. Would you try to get the meeting with the DM or would you try to get the meeting with the user like at any of your companies or all the above? Info from the user meeting with the DM. Okay. So let's right. do... So let's, let's touch that real quick. Just before like we got this time, let's use it. If you want to get a meeting with me and I know you haven't talked to anyone on my team, why the hell would I talk to you? Period. Right? If you would spoken to a rep on my team and a manager on the team and said, Hey, KD, subject line, 1.7 hours a day. First sentence. I spoke with two of your reps and your managers, and they let me know they're spending about two hours a day searching for leads. One, were you aware of it? Two, would you like to fix this? Let me know. Ah, that's so simple. That's that's like no bullshit, not about me, not about what right. we do. So mm -hmm. simple. Right. Be, and, but, but because I know you talk to the team, I know what it's real. Right. So like, holy shit, maybe I didn't know that. Maybe I didn't. Right. But now I'm aware of it. Right. And you can learn that from the user. So get info from the users, info yep. from the users, then try to set the meeting with the DM. But either way, you work your way up. So all right, back to your back. Got it. So, so the persona we're going to say okay. it's the VP of sales, cool. KD at snack nation. Okay. And then you said the next step is the let's go, problem. Let's go patient pop. Let's go patient pop. You know, oh, yeah. Patient moved, pop. Uh, moved, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's move on. So patient pop, you're selling to these practices. Yep. Uh, and you're, you're the, like, basically the practice growth solution, right? You enhance and automate each touch point in the patient journey at practice pop. So uh, the, the VP of sales or inside sales, KD, Kevin Dorsey, the problem is you need to what acquire more um acquire more practices yep that, that'd be the first problem right that's, okay. that's the first so that'd be the problem quota right <laughs> quota is the problem getting the quota okay right. yep hitting our revenue target our revenue right. number for the whole team okay yep next box what are all the things i'm doing right now to get there okay and then in right. your opinion what are you doing right now and you're new to it, but you'll, you'll, you probably know this now. Like, what are you doing there now? Um, to, yeah. to so, you, so this is where, so if you don't have me on the phone, if you're trying to just build out the sheet, right? This is just general research, right? This is knowing like, Hey, what do most VPs of sales do to get to quota? Right. Yeah. It's going to fall. Buy leads from life. someone else. They're doing calling, mm -hmm. emailing, social selling, like with an outreach sales loft. Uh, they're using sales navigator or LinkedIn. Um, they're booking a few appointments a day, but they'd love to have 10 a day booked. Um, and they're, you know, spending 70% of their time with the wrong people, bad data, bad leads, CRM data entry, whatever. So you're, you're going, you're going too far down your product route first, right? Just okay. start with, okay. I, you know, I'm doing outbound email, doing outbound calls. I have, I'm running demos. I have, you know, reps making 70, 80 calls per day. I have a trainer and I work with marketing, right? So like one of the things I'm just doing to get to quota, then you go to the next layer down and go, how does seamless affect each one of those? Okay. So how does seamless affect how well my demos are run? Okay. Give me, give That's me that. Let's go, let's go, let's go the different route. Like it's easy to, Oh, contact info, contact info. How does seamless make my demos better? We give you hundreds of insights on the contact and the company so that you know everything about the business and the persona to connect 
motivate and inspire them to either like uh, buy or take action or tie the value prop ROI. Right. So what we're doing right now, by the way, is we're building your first cadence. You're going to take all the things that I do as a VP of sales to get to quota. And then you are going to write messaging on how seamless affects each one of those things. And then you get into the, so the fuck what, right? So the, so the fuck what you say like, all right, I'd have all the insights. So the fuck what Brandon? So, so I'm having insights on my demo. Right. So what? What's the answer to that? So the uh, fuck what? Conversion rate. Yeah. So from meeting held to closed one mm-hmm. conversion rate increases one third. Right. So then what you have to do there is you have to piece it together and explain how that happens. Right. So how, okay. how is having those. Is that the gap? Yes. Yes. So Got it. I, I so, use so I, the fuck what? So yeah, I use this example. Oh, I was just going to say, so, so the fuck what, and how you actually do it. Right. Because right now, a lot of people, there's the gap, right? How you get all those insights. Right. And then if you're trying to write a good email and you probably know, so you studied Dan Kennedy, find places to use the word imagine. So imagine your reps going into a demo. Imagine your reps going into a demo. Rep A is going in blind. Rep B has the five latest Twitter posts, two of their tech crunch articles, three of their LinkedIn profiles and whatever, an article that was written on Forbes in front of them. So now they can use that information throughout the demo. You think maybe your conversion rates would go up if you had a demo running like that? Let me know if you want to talk. Yep. Wow. That's fire. Yeah. Okay. So, so the model, um, after the gap. So when you fill in the gap, imagine blank. And I also, um, I've got a few like uh, templates or scripts that you fill in, like you're talking about um, from a few of these guys, like Frank Kern, you had mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, bl- the value proposition without pain or pain, mm-hmm. like without yeah. spending 10 hours yeah. a day on data entry or uh, mm-hmm. wasting $10,000 per rep on sales tech. Like mm-hmm. yeah. dude, the so combat that, is though, critical. For outbound, that doesn't work unless you know they have the pain. That's something to be careful of. Cause if I get an email that says without spending five hours a day searching and my people aren't spending five hours a day searching, I immediately squash like an it. Idiot. Yeah. Right? I lose credibility. So Got people, it. They, that's how a lot of outbounds go is they apply a, a general pain without knowing if I have it or not. And so I just, you just ignore it. Right. But then what we create there too, then is your gap question. So now you got a VP of the sales on the phone. We'll go prospecting, not even demo, right? Yep. You got on the phone. Hey, I'm writing this hoping down. Ask you a few, I'm hoping to ask you a few quick questions to see if it's even worth you looking in to seamless, right? Like, do you got a sec? All right, shoot, go for it. All right, real quick. How is your team quickly accessing some key insights before the demo? Like, do you, are you buying it? Do the reps have to research it on their own? Are they kind of winging it? Like, how are they getting those insights right before the demo? Well, now, so in here, here's the beauty of selling through questions. I wouldn't ask you that question if I didn't have a solution to it. Right. Yeah. Notice I have, I haven't, I, I haven't used the value prop yet. I haven't said seamless.ai was created to ensure that your team can quickly right. access all the insights that they need to before they make their call. No, I asked permission to ask questions. I said, yes. And I said, how are you doing X right now? And okay. I said, well, shit, like, yeah, I think they're just kind of winging it. And then you go to your next question. It's like, okay, well then how are they doing? why how are they how are they doing why okay another thing that your product solves okay because what you're doing is you're breaking up like these problems because if all the by the way if all my answers exposed there's no problem then you get off the phone with me we built right. an internal system that allows me to look it up real quick oh wow hell yeah good for you okay well then how are you getting all that information plugged into your crm right away oh same thing we, we built it out it goes in right away no problem jesus okay i'm Last question. I mean, does it take a lot of time to maintain that? Like, is it updating all the time? Oh yeah. Updates automatically. Shit. Did you rip off our software? Right. 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 Hey, man. Doesn't sound like you have any problems here. Right. And then move on. There's thousands of people to sell to. Yeah. So, so, so it's personal. That'll, that'll be, that'll be, that'll be, this will be five grand by the way. Call ah, consult, I, I love that. Call right now. So, per, so persona problem, mm-hmm. 
Yep. What are they doing to solve it? Mm-hmm. Uh, STFW. So how how you solve it? So how you benefit it, and then so the fuck what? Okay, so it goes persona problem. How you solve it? Yep. Then so the fuck what? The impact of that. So the right. fuck what? Yep. The impact of that. I'm writing this down because the yep. audience is, could be driving. They could be watching. Yep. And then the gap. And then, and then you write the gap. The gap is the question there, right? It's like, how are you blank right yep. now? Right. And, and if down. they answer that, like, uh, like obviously they're not solving it and they need your solution. Mm-hmm. What, what comes after the gap? Another one. Just try to get rolling. three. Minimum Try to get three. three. Minimum Got three it. if you can. If the first one's big enough, they'll let you know. Right? Okay. If, if one gap is enough, they'll let you know. They'll be like, dude, man, yeah, this just sucks. They're just this, 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 and this. Try to get three, right? It gets the conversation going. And now here is your value prop. So this is where it all finishes out. Got it. Okay. okay. Sweet. I think this might make sense. Your gap, gap, and gap, which is causing pain pain and pain Mm -hmm. seamless was designed to oppo gap oppo gap oppo gap benefit 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 can we set up some time tomorrow to talk about this further to see if we could help you wow value proposition and then close yep damn dude i just i just outlined your next book or your new book man i i got the whole thing done hey here's how to write for sales p p h s g you know p u c dude and then each of those is a chapter uh damn man that is amazing we're gonna we should create a little sheet for the audience that they could fill in i mean that that's what i'm talking about business model design like and value proposition design, they have these boxes that you fill in for every cadence, anything that you do, running a business or writing value propositions or whatever. This is the exact same thing. Kevin Dorsey just created the sales letter model for you that you can fill in or or beg him. He'll, he'll take a $1,000 check. He'll send you the uh, sales letter uh, b- model and, and yeah. shoot it to you, man. This was incredible. So, so for those that want to become that want to, you know, to wrap up the call that Mm -hmm. for those that want to know people better, that want to master their messaging, you know, in addition to, to following this model that you just gave us, what's like the one recommend recommendation that you would give if you just hired a bunch of people, you just hired a ton of people at patient pop. You guys are at 400 employees. You're growing to 500. The next 100, all salespeople, you know, that they got to know your people that they got a right badass messaging. What's your tip for them to like get started with that? Let's see if I'm giving one tip for them to get better. I guess I, I'll put it into two because I give everyone the same advice when they start to work for me or anyone that I mentor or anything. It's outwork and outlearn. Right? Like wow. outwork the people around you, which is actually relatively easy. Like outworking people is not hard. Most people don't know what hard work actually is they they do busy week for they don't know what hard work is so outwork you have to work hard but the out learn out and learn this, this is outwork by the way like and, yeah. and let me know if i'm right or wrong kevin but like r- taking the time to write your sequence or cadence to to script out these questions the persona the problem how you solve so the fuck what gap questions value proposition and then close like this exercise is really fucking hard like, cause I've done these types of exercises over week, like three days with business management teams at IBM and Google. Uh, so I know how hard it is. Like, I think yeah. that would be probably working yeah. harder. Yeah, that is working hard. It's taking the time to do those things. The second part is the outlearn, right? And it's not just the reading. It's not just the studying. It's the practice. Actually practice your craft, right? Like, Every single day before a demo, I was role playing. Every single day on the inside, on my way into work, I was going over objections out loud in the car. This was pre Bluetooth, so I know I looked crazy. You could tell I was talking to myself. You know what I'm saying? Like that practice to what you're learning is going to be the key. Okay, you learned it in a book. Good for you. Now go do it and track the results and see if it's working. But salespeople don't practice their craft enough. 
There's no reason why you and I are reading more sales books than the average salesperson is. There's no reason why I'm role-playing just as much as a salesperson when I don't even get to sell anymore, which I miss. I love the sale, right? Thank so you. it's outwork and outlearn and start, you know, just, ah, man, it is. I guess talk about other patterns. One of the number one patterns of successful reps is they all spoke to the most successful reps when they came in. It seems like common knowledge, Interesting. but they don't do it. They just would study the most successful reps yeah. and then try to emulate them and do what they do. Right. By far. So at patient pop, I came in, I did a one-on-one -on -one with every single rep, every single rep. My first two weeks I was locked in a room. I sat with a rep, every single rep on my team for almost an hour. The top performers all shared that. And it wasn't through a leading question. It was, you know, as you go through, like, what did you do? How did you level up? What's led to your success? All of them independent of each other mentioned that. They, that studied. they studied these guys. Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and what's interesting is with that, I, that that's amazing. That's actually a, another massive tip. You owe Kevin, send Kevin another <laughs> grand guys. Yeah. And if you're underperforming or you're average, get on the damn phone with your rep, pay the rep who gives a shit. Hey, Johnny, I know your time's valuable and I know you're busy chasing deals. I'm going to pay you to work for you for a day. I would pay. No one's, I've never seen this happen before, but now like knowing what Kevin just taught me and knowing other shit, the top rep doesn't have time to, to mentor you typically. Mm -hmm. Fucking pay the top rep to go work for him. Hey, say whatever you need me to do, I'm going to follow you and work for you for a day, a week, a month, and that'll be probably more valuable than you trying to learn it on your mm -hmm. own. I pay sure. a lot of really smart people a shitload of money to, right. to learn what they do. Gary V, Ryan Sirhan, Grant Cardone, Keith Rosen, mm -hmm. Anthony Inarino. These guys are guys that I'm paying a shitload of money for to try to learn as much as possible. Guys like Kevin Dorsey on copywriting, like pay the people that you want to learn from. And obviously if Kevin's saying, study the experts at your company, pay them, follow them, work for them for free for a day, week, hour, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from my experience, man, most top performers are actually very open and willing to share. Just no one ever asks them. Yeah. They just don't. And by the way, most top performers actually do have time. Uh, my middle of the pack almost always works harder than my top of the pack. In terms of pure hours and effort, the top's just better. They're just better at what they More do. More effective. Right? They have, they have time. Just ask. If you haven't yet, shit. This is why I do tribal training. So like my team helps onboard the team. So I force feed this, find a pattern, make it a process. Now my team onboards the team, right? So when a new rep comes in, I spend very little time with them. I've recorded all the modules. I've recorded all the videos on how they should doing things, but then they're yep. spending five hours a day, their first month practicing with their team. Okay. I'm force feeding that interaction. I'm forcing them to interact with the top performers and they're role playing with people on their team. Got right. it, because you learn from that, from patient pop, the whole right. what, tribal training. It, yeah. What does that mean? What is that? So, I haven't so that. tribal training is something I rolled out at service Titan. It's just been a game changer for my onboarding. So now the team teaches the team. So I learned this from the culture code and the talent code where the idea that like having one teacher is actually relatively new to the human species. If you think about it, in terms of just like learning from one person, the tribe taught the tribe. Right. And it's actually shown that people retain information better that way. Again, science of learning. And so what's happening now is I record, okay, here's your outbound script. And I record a video module, walking them through, explaining what it is. So they get to watch it a few times, listen and That's take awesome. notes. Then we come together, we talk about it, we do a couple, but then they are spending 30 to 45 minutes with different reps on my team every single day, practicing it and getting feedback on it. Right. So by the time they come out of a month, they've already gotten in 400, 500 repetitions of what they're supposed to be doing. Right. And so now they're feeling ready. They're feeling confident and the learning stronger when they're getting it from multiple people. So the tribe trains the tribe. And I've had people come out of their first month hitting full ramp in the second month because they've gotten so much more practice. Right. If you think about it, you know, the 10,000 hour rule, I talked about this Rob Jepson, right? Like yeah. 10,000 hour rule. Okay. Yep. How long is a demo? One hour. So you're telling me you're going to need to run 10,000 demos before you'll reach a level of mastery. If you're doing one a day, that means, right, like you can do this out. My people are 10, getting 10,000 days. Right. My people are getting hundreds of repetitions their first month. So when they get out on the phone, 
they're actually ready to do their job. And it creates a much tighter tribe mentality too, because they taught each other. So they hold each other accountable to it. It's changed my onboarding immensely. It's so much better. I spend less time doing it and the reps are coming out better. So I'm building out that academy right now at Patient Pop. I did it at Service Titan and I'll do it anywhere I ever go after this, if I ever go anywhere after this, because it's such a better way to onboard people. Wow. Yeah. I, I love that. That's really exciting. I I know one of my takeaways from this uh, conversation is like every day I, I'll probably assign my reps like role playing, have it randomized and they have to meet with each other, role play. They're going to yep. learn. We already record every call, every demo because mm-hmm. I'm learning things from my team every day. And I think to your point about being uh, adaptable and coachable at the beginning of the call, like Dude, from the top down, bottom up, everywhere in between, like make sure that your leadership understands like there's not one way. They're not the best. You always have to be optimizing. Like I've read 150 sales books. I've made millions in sales, lost millions in sales. And I'm still trying to learn from my brand new SDR or my AE or my Mm -hmm. software developer how we Mm -hmm. can improve selling. Like shit, that's why we record everything. The problem is, is I got to institute it daily. Like you had mentioned, that's smart. Yeah. Uh, like I'll share and like, that's something where even my team does it right now. So from, I think this past week, it was from 11 to 1130 or one to one that I can't remember the entire SDR org is practicing at the same time every day together. Right. Okay. D it's the last week of the month. You can't take them off the phones. Uh, yeah, I can because I want them to be better when they are on the phone. Like that, that, Right. I just, Conversion I'm, rates will dramatically right. increase by 20, 50% if they know what to say and how to say it the best right. way. When, when people tell me they don't have time to practice because they don't want to take them off the phone, I was like, all right, so let me get this straight. You want them making more bad calls. Right. Like that's what you're telling me right now is you'd rather them, instead of getting better, make more bad calls. Okay. You, you go do that. You go force them to make a bunch of bad calls versus my team getting better every single day and being better on their calls. And by the way, let's be real. SDRs waste way more than 30 minutes in a fucking day. They have time to practice. They're yep. not losing any productivity and they're fine. So yep. it's good. Man, it but makes them happy because like when they're practicing and they're getting better and the next call yes. that they get to book an appointment, that shit builds confidence. And if they're yes. calling and calling and calling and they're not converting they're going to get defeated and then eventually quit. So the training, yep. they love it because they love like, dude, SDRs love development. They love yeah. getting better. They need people, people to help them get better. So real quick, I want to change one word in there. People love development, not just SDRs. True. People love development. If someone's getting better with you every single month, they'll stay with you forever. And it's not for the money. It's because they know they're always going to get better. People want development. People want security. People want to feel safe. People want to feel cared for. That's what they want, right? And that's what we have to build out. So, but that's my amazing. man, I got to jump here. I'm yes. on daddy duty this week. I know. Weekend, I, so I got to run as well. It's my, it's, it's my birthday. My fiance is texting me hey. like a thousand times. Oh, and I'm shit. like, I'm All like, right, get out of here. I'm wrapping Go. it up. Go. Look, Kevin Dorsey, thank you so much. Where can people find you, connect with you, follow you besides buying our yeah. content writing for sales course next year. Where Hell can yeah. people uh, just, find you? Just find, find me on LinkedIn. I don't have Twitter. I don't have Instagram. I probably still have a MySpace somewhere, but find me on LinkedIn, Kevin Dorsey at Patient Pop. Let's Kevin go. Dorsey at Patient Pop. Uh, look, everyone, Kevin Dorsey, follow him. He's a sales dev exec of the year, top 100 sales coach, speaker, consultant, sales, in, inside sales leader. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. Buy a copy of the book today at www.secretsalesbook.com. That's secretsalesbook.com. And thank you, Kevin, so much. I know I got to write you a check for everyone getting all the knowledge today. Thank you so much today, man. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%. We release new episodes every Monday and Thursday. So make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube to never miss an episode.